Hello and welcome to this lecture on Charles Dickens's The Signal Man. This is a very famous story of Dickens and it's a gothic story where the supernatural gets a very intense treatment as you will know if you have read the story. So I'm going to do a bit of close reading and also uh, connect the implications to uh, the meanings in terms of the Gothic as well as try to uh, look at the anxieties of the age that are reflected in the story. So a little bit of uh, background information in terms of the story, it was published in 1866 and it is part of his collection called the Mugby Junction and this story was um, published in the Christmas edition of his magazine uh, which he edited called the All the Year Around. I am going to show you uh, two illustrations here and uh, the first one is a picture of the Clayton Tunnel crash. There was a train crash uh, at this uh, uh, locale in 1861 and the second one is an illustration of the Staplehurst uh, rail crash in which Dickens himself was involved and um, critics say that uh, these two train crashes, the one in 1861 and 1865, the other in 1865 could have influenced Dickens to come up with this fantastic uh, gothic story in 1866 where the key um, figure the key figure in the story uh, becomes the train. Of course, there is also the spectre which I will come back to, but the train becomes an important uh, uh, plot element. In fact, it is associated with the way the plot develops and uh, ends. Let me talk a little bit about um, Charles Dickens and the railway. So, Dickens does capture uh, the imagination uh, associated with the railway age in his work, especially in terms of uh, his fiction Dombey and Son, where uh, the railways come to represent an exuberant forward looking age. So, it is associated with progress. And uh, it kind of celebrates indirectly the technological advancement of that uh, period. There is a lot of hustle and bustle, sound and noise uh, linked to the uh, railway transport network. So, things are looking up in terms of the railways in this particular uh, fiction, Dombey and Son. Dickens of course you know that goes back to the stagecoach uh, most often in the majority of his uh, works. Now when you come to uh, this particular story the signal man what dominates the story is a sinister silence, sinister something that is threatening uh, an insidious silence, a, a dangerous silence and of course there is a lot of solitude there. It is set in a, a, a place where there is uh, not a lot of uh, human uh, presence uh, you, as you will know if you read the story it is in an isolated spot where it is just the signal man, his signal, the red signal or, uh, and, and his uh, small cabin by the side of the tunnel. So, it is an isolated spot spot and uh, when I mention these two points you will immediately remember the gothic motives. The gothic motives associated with um, setting isolated castles, country houses, um, you know uh, other domestic spaces which are not amidst the hustle and bustle of the city or the town. And, um, what we do have here is the faint light of the stars and the feeble red lamp uh, which is at the entrance to the tunnel. So, these are the presences, these are the factors in terms of the setting of the story. We do not have a lot of uh, human figures uh, except in moments where there is some kind of catastrophe uh, going on in terms of the uh, narrative. Now, 
the signal man begins with these uh, words. Hello, below there. It's a fantastic opening uh, in a short story. And this becomes a, even a refrain, a repetitive set of words uh, used by someone. Um, and somehow this refrain comes to have a particular signification. As you will know when you read the story, below there, uh, it can be either literal, something deep down in the depths, and it could be metaphoric. If it's metaphoric, then the question is, is it alluding to hell itself? When he heard a voice thus calling to him, he was standing at the door of his box with a flag in his hand, furled round its short pole. One would have thought, considering the nature of the ground, that he could not have doubted from what quarter the voice came. But instead of looking up to where I stood on the top of the steep cutting nearly over his head, he turned himself about and looked down the line. So we have a first person narrator who is going to tell us the story of his experiences with a particular man. I'll come to him in a minute. We have a first person narrator who's calling to someone who is standing below and that is this signal man. The one who is in charge of the signals uh, by the side of a tunnel. So that is the setting. And the narrator tells us that I called out to him, but instead of looking up at me, who's uh, standing uh, at a height, and uh, this figure looks down the line, the railway line, why is he not turning uh, in the direction where the sound is coming from? So that in itself is a puzzle. So something is amiss. The, uh, the signal man does not behave in expected ways. There is something odd about him and this oddity will increase as you read the story. The narrator tells us that his figure was foreshortened and shadowed down in the deep trench you need to understand that this railway line is at the bottom of a trench. It's, it's in a uh, valley-like situation and this narrator is standing at the top uh, uh, of a cutting and he's looking down. So he says that the signal man's figure was foreshortened and shadowed down in the deep trench and mine was high above him, so steeped in the glow of an angry sunset that I had shade in my eyes with my hand before I saw him at all. Hello, below. So uh, again, this uh, refrain, as I pointed out, uh, is very important uh, to the story. And we will come to know that it is associated uh, not only with this narrator, but also with the specter, which is going to haunt um, this story. Now let's look at the symbolic significances. The first one, what does it uh, remind us of? It reminds us of another story called The Red Room by H. G. Wells, where we will see the narrator being uh, distorted uh, in the reflection of a mirror. So some kind of distortion is associated with Gothic fiction. So uh, is this again symbolic of the distortion of the psyche, of the human psyche? Is that what is um, kind of uh, probed or explored in Gothic narrative? So it can be a thematic of Gothic fiction. Now again, uh, the deep trench um, could signify once again the underworld or hell in uh, Christian terms, underworld in classical terms. 
and this narrator is standing on a high ground. So, he could represent the norm, the ordinary, the reasonable who is coming into contact with all things contrary to this. So, the signal man is associated with an extraordinary world, it is associated with the unreasonable, the spiritual, the supernatural and it is not the norm, it is something highly exciting and uh, not uh, uh, usual. And he is at uh, trouble uh, to notice him, he has, he has uh, to shade his eyes to look at him because there is an angry sunset, again this is very interesting the glow of an angry sunset perhaps mentions that even the elements are hostile. Just then there came a vague vibration in the earth and air quickly changing into a violent pulsation. So, as he is shouting uh, down to the figure of the signal man in the deep trench, there is a sound, a vague vibration, a movement in the earth and air which turns into a violent pulsation, violent movement and an oncoming rush that caused me to start back as though it had the force to draw me down. When such vapour as rose to my height from this rapid train had passed me and was skimming away over the landscape, I looked down again and saw him refurling the flag he had shown while the train went by. So, what happens is that it is just a simple incident of a train uh, passing by, but um, the train does make a lot of movement and sound and, and noise and it affects the narrator. So, there is some kind of violence which is interesting and these are associated with the train violence and some kind of vagueness it is as if the train itself becomes a supernatural object figure. And this is symbolic of course and this affects the narrator, he starts back, he is not expecting that train and so he is affected and he feels as if the train had the force to draw me down. So, if he comes down of course, he will meet with an accident. So, the train is somehow violently attracting or trying to attack, uh, attract this uh, narrator and uh, look at this word vapor, vapor is the steam that comes out of the engine and um, now it becomes very clear what the function of this uh, he is. Uh, he is a man who kind of um, uh, is in charge of the signal at the tunnel. Rapid train again that is very interesting, it is associated with a lot of speed. So, train is associated with speed, it is associated with something almost mystical in its power. I am kind of interpreting it in this way because it is associated with violence as well, violent pulsa pulsation is um, used by Dickens to talk about the train. So, we want to come uh, to a conclusion about what the significance is or what the anxieties that this train embodies for the Victorians. The cutting was extremely deep, the trench was extremely deep and unusually precipitate, it is sharp. So, uh, it, 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 there is not a smooth incline from bottom to top, it is sharp, it was uh, made through a clammy stone, it was cut through a sticky wet damp stone that became oozier and wetter as I went down. For these reasons I found the way long enough to give me time to recall a singular air of reluctance or compulsion with which he had pointed out the path. So, what happens uh, uh, at this point of time in the story is that the, uh, the narrator uh, calls to this signal man and the signal man um, responds to the question of the narrator which is that is there a path to below from uh, where he is standing and the signal man points out to a particular path and the narrator is coming down from his height. So, that is what is happening, so he is kind of uh, coming down below from the top and as he is walking the path becomes oozier, wetter and I want you to think about this word clammy as well. 
So uh, he is moving to the bottom from his height and um, as he is walking down he thinks about the demeanor or the attitude of the signal man which is one of reluctance or compulsion. He does not want this man to come down but he has no choice because he wants to come and visit him. And um, again the narrator points out that his attitude was one of uh, expectation and watchfulness. He is looking at the newcomer with a lot of curiosity and um, the newcomer is aware of it, the narrator is aware of it and wonders what caused it. So I want you to think about the setting uh, of this particular trench which is associated with dampness. And again um, the signification is that it is not a pleasant space, it is unpleasant, unpleasant spaces something that is bleak and gloomy and again the word hostile not conducive to human comfort are associated with the gothic settings. Now the question is it is in this particular space we have this modern transport of the train network. So you can see a very close connection between the past and the present. How close these two uh, modes of life have come together and when they come together is there a conflict. So that seems to be one of the thematic uh, uh, point of view of this particular story. Okay, I have an image of a signal man um, with a flag there and there is this very uh, disturbing red lamp um, this with a faint uh, reddish glow and there is darkness of the tunnel. So, the tunnel is an interesting space, uh, so are cellars, underground passages, rooms called red, red room. So, all these settings are perfect spots for gothic narratives. And this particular tunnel is very interesting because the tunnel here has a scientific connection too because it is associated with modern transport is not it. Now what kind of a man is the signal man? He was a dark sallow man with a dark beard and rather heavy eyebrows. His pose was in as solitary and dismal a place as I ever saw. On either side a dripping wet wall of jagged stone excluding all view but a strip of the sky. The perspective one way only a crooked prolongation of this great dungeon, the shorter perspective in the other direction terminating in a gloomy red light and the gloomier entrance to a black tunnel in whose massive architecture there was a barbarous depressing and forbidding air. So little sunlight ever found its way to this spot that it had an earthy deadly smell. So much cold wind rushed through it that it struck chill to me as if I had left the natural world. It is a very interesting uh, last comment in this particular world, it is as if he has left the natural world and come into an unnatural world, unnatural world, underworld, the world of superstition spirits, the spirit world or again symbolically hell.
So again, this passage is about the setting of this particular tunnel which has a, in one direction this red light, the disturbing red light and in the other direction it has this massive tunnel which is barbaric, barbarous, depressing, it is very uh, bleak and forbidding, it's, uh, it, it kind of makes you feel frightened. So there is a threatening air to this uh, dark tunnel that, um, the, no, that the writer is at pains to point to us and again the setting if you, if you look at the way the sides of the passage um, are described it is dark, it is solitary, it is dismal, it is wet, the walls are wet, uh, you know dripping wet and jagged stone, sharp stone which might injure uh, someone who is not very careful as he or she is walking by and um, the sky is excluded, the sky is excluded, you can just see a strip of the sky. So perhaps it's also, um, as I pointed out, it's it's dark. There's uh, there's a, perhaps a twilight sense here, and um, he says that the architecture is also massive uh, to strike fear in the person who is uh, witnessing it, and uh, little sunlight ever finds uh, its way to the spot. Uh, all this makes this place have a deadly smell as well, not a very uh, happy smell, it is a deadly smell and it does not belong um, you know uh, it, it is as if it does not belong to the earth itself and again makes us think about other spaces and it is cold, um, it, it is not warm, it is cold uh, and uh, nobody is comfortable. So this is a perfect, perfect gothic setting. The only odd thing about it is the fact that it is modernity that is kind of passing through this odd uh, setting. So um, I have an image here which should give you a sense of what the location is like. So this is the uh, part which he describes as being wet um, and full of jagged stones and since this is uh, a narrow passage where there is hardly any sunlight. And this is a signal box where uh, this man uh, uh, spends his time, the signal man spends his time and um, the narrator comes from the top and down below to meet the man. So here is an image which uh, kind of indicates um, how the scene might have looked like uh, and here is the signal man with the narrator meeting him. This was a lonesome spot, uh, uh, post to occupy I said. Uh, the narrator said and it had riveted my attention when I looked down from up yonder. A visitor was a rarity I should suppose, not an unwelcome rarity I hoped. In me he merely saw a man who had been shut up within narrow limits all his life and who being at last set free had a newly awakened interest in these great works. To such purpose I spoke to him. So when the narrator comes down to speak to the uh, signal man, he says um, the usual things. Uh, he says that uh, you know perhaps a visitor is very rare in this particular uh, setting, and um, you know uh, he uh, says that you know this place like uh, looks like as if it's very lonesome, isolated. Now. Uh, the narrator guesses what the thoughts of the signal man could be about uh, this visitor. So he uh, writes that the uh, signal man uh, may think that you know the narrator is a man who had been shut up with the narrow uh, limits. Um, the narrow limits could be his um, uh, life in general with his professional pursuits and other related activities and this could be very limited, that is the uh, guess of the uh, signal man about this newcomer, this visitor and this is an interesting point if you think about uh, the preoccupations of the gothic which is supposed to tell the reader that there are more things in heaven and earth um, than are to be met with in ordinary walks of life. So um, the narrator also uh, kind of indicates that he, this entire world is completely new to him, he has um, newly awakened uh, to such great works associated with the railway and other attendant uh, issues. Now it occurs 
to the narrator that something is terribly amiss uh, with this signal man who is not very welcoming um, uh, to put it plainly. Uh, the monstrous thought came into my mind as I perused the fixed eyes and the saturnine face that this was a spirit not a man. I have speculated since whether they may have been uh, whether they may have been infection in his mind. And uh, in turn I stepped back but in making the action I detected in his eyes some latent fear of me this put the monstrous thought to flight. So, these two um, uh, statements must be kind of read together and analyzed together because we have this uh, newcomer the visitor the narrator thinking that the signal man himself could be a spirit not a man. And then he realizes that perhaps it is a man whose mind may have been infected that could be something wrong with this signal man uh, uh, in, in, in terms of his psyche. And in turn what uh, he understands from the face of the signal man is this that the signal man thinks that the narrator could be a spectre. So, both of them are uh, thinking uh, that the other could be a supernatural spirit. So, once uh, the narrator realizes that this signal man is afraid of him he uh, lets go of this monstrous thought. So, you can see the mirroring of ideas here in these two figures. Right? And what it tells us is that the uh, idea of the specter or some kind of ghost is foremost in the minds of the people in this narrative. It is foremost in the mind of the society of this period. So, there is a greater preoccupation with the dead, uh, with the spiritual, with the occult, with the mystical. So, that preoc uh, preoccupation could lead to narratives such as uh, what Dickens have produced for us. Now, uh, the two figures uh, have a conversation in the signal man's place in that cabin and uh, here is an illustration which gives you a sense of uh, this kind of meeting between the two. Now, what kind of a signal man is he? What kind of work he does? He has to uh, do a lot of communication with other centers in relation to the uh, smooth, uh, you know, uh, transport of the railway. So, this passage tells us of the kind of work in which he is engaged in exactness and watchfulness. where what was required of him uh, and of actual work manual labor he had next to none. To change that signal to trim those lights and to turn this iron handle now and then was all he had to do under that head. Regarding those many long and lonely hours of which I seemed to make so much he could only say that the routine of his life had shaped itself in the, into that form and he had grown used to it. So, what kind of work does he do? He has to uh, uh, watch out for the signal, he has to change the lights and he has to uh, turn the iron handle shift uh, the iron handle so that everything runs smoothly in terms of the train. So, that is uh, most of his work um, and, and that is uh, very, very little manual labor that is something we need to note. Uh, and. Uh, the rest the long hours that he spends in the cabin is something that he has got used to it according to the signal man. I want to come back to this point about manual labor. Why is Dickens at pains to talk about it? So, manual labor is usually associated with the working classes especially in that period in the Victorian period. So, he wants to tell the reader that this man is not uh, a figure who is entirely a working class figure not entirely belonging to this class and he has um, associations with the professional with the professional world with the professional classes. Uh, in which most of the middle class can be uh, uh, contained too um, and what are the uh, signifiers that are associated with this class it, which, and they are exactness and being very very observant 
being very very observant. So, uh, Dickens wants to make the reader look very kindly on this uh, working class uh, come professional class figure here in this particular story which is why he says that uh, he did not have uh, to do a lot of uh, manual labor. Now, this narrator quizzes him further in terms of the uh, uh, details associated with his work and the questions um, go like this. Was it necessary for him when on duty always to remain in that channel of damp air? And could he never rise into the sunshine from between those high stone walls? Why? That depended upon times and circumstances. This, this is the answer of the signal man. He says that that depends. Under some conditions there would be less upon the line than under others and the same held good as to certain hours of the day and night. In bright weather he did choose occasions for getting a little above these lower shadows, but being at all times liable to be called by his electric bell and at such times listening for it with redoubled anxiety the relief was less than I would suppose. So, the uh, narrator is trying to figure out the day to day routine of this particular signal man and he is uh, obsessing with this particular uh, nature of this uh, space. He says this is a channel of damp air, cannot you get out into the uh, sunlight, uh, cannot you get away from between these stone walls. The implication is that he is in a very very um, uh, 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 unpleasant space, especially it is a space which reminds one of incarceration. So, uh, and the signal man kind of uh, tells him that it depends on uh, the you know uh, hours, it depends on how busy he is and sometimes he did get out from these lower shadows. Look at the way the setting is described as a place of shadows, shadows something that is not of light, not of light would imply there is a lot of unreason quote unquote. And he has to constantly think about the electric bell through which the other uh, centers would communicate with this uh, signal man to make sure that the uh, train goes by smoothly. So, the electric bell is very very interesting as well uh, because um, the electric bell is an object of technology which is kind of exploited in this gothic narrative for supernatural purposes as you will know when you read the story. Now, um, this passage once again connects us to the earlier uh, point about uh, this figure not being entirely from the working classes. So, we have further information to suggest that he could be from a uh, uh, sophisticated or a, a better family. On my trusting that he would excuse the remark that he had been well educated and I hope I might say without offence perhaps educated about that station. He observed that instincts uh, that instances of slight incongruity in such uh, wise would rarely be found wanting among large bodies of men that he had heard it was so in the workhouses, in the police force, even in that last desperate source the army and that he knew it was so more or less in any great railway staff. He had been when young if I could believe it sitting in that heart he scarcely could a student of natural philosophy and had attended lectures, but he had run wild misused his opportunities gone down and never risen again. He had no complaint to offer about that he had made his bed he lay upon it it was far too late to make another. So, this passage does tell us that this man was once a student of natural philosophy, he did uh, uh, you know study the sciences, the natural sciences, he in fact uh, went to attend uh, lectures, but then he uh, uh, kind of abused his opportunities, he ran wild, he was not disciplined and therefore, he has gone down in the world, he is pointing to the um, you know the way in which he fell through the social ladders and he has literally come down to to this trench um, uh, where he is a signal man attending to the trains and he is not able to rise again in society uh, symbolically and literally as well.
and he uh, also tells us that in the army, uh, in the railway, in the workhouses, um, you, you know, you can find people who are somewhat educated and uh, who uh, have once been uh, well educated but have uh, lost the opportunities that have been given to them. So such incongruity can be found in such settings. So what uh, we are to understand is that this signal man is also such an incongruity. He was several times interrupted by the little bell and had to read off messages and send replies. Once he had to stand without the door and display a flag as a train passed and make some verbal communication to the driver. In the discharge of his duties, I observed him to be remarkably exact and vigilant, breaking off his discourse at a syllable and remaining silent until what he had to do was done. So this passage once again uh, tells us that he is a perfect worker, a perfect professional. And if you read this passage closely, you will understand the word exact coming up once again. Um, and where is it? He's vigilant and exact. He's extremely cautious. And he does his job perfectly without any hitch. So what we are to understand that is that he is a, a man who is very, very organized and who is not very, uh, um, you know, uh, indisciplined. So this is the setup that the narrator is trying to impress on the uh, reader so that we are not going to doubt about um, his sanity. That's, that's the premise. He's an excellent worker and he is not from the lower walks of life. So um, these two should make us uh, kind of buy or accept uh, the uh, statements and the viewpoints that the signal man is going to tell us as the story progresses. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.